So just to begin with, we'll have each of the panelists introduce themselves and then we'll get into it. So Jeremy, you might need to turn your microphone. Uh, I'm Jeremy Howard. Uh, I'm uh, the founder and CEO of Inlytic, which is using uh, deep learning to uh, change how medicine is practiced in order to improve the efficiency uh, and uh, accuracy of patient care. Uh, previously, I was the president of um, Kaggle, um, and before that, I ran a couple of startups, one in email, one in insurance pricing, and before that, I was in business strategy um, at um, McKinsey & Company. Which is where the Excel comes from. Which is where the Excel comes from, yes. Uh, my name is uh, Ahmad Abdul Qadr. I'm the uh, lead of the applied machine learning team at Facebook. Um, uh, our, wor uh, you know, our work is mainly involved in um, uh, you know, enabling machine learning, deep learning included, for the you know, Facebook, uh, various Facebook groups and teams. Um, um, I worked for Microsoft before, I worked for Google. About you know, Facebook for two years. Hi, uh, my name is Xinhua Lo. I'm from Vicarious. So, uh, Vicarious is a small research startup focusing on building uh, the next generation AI system that can perform at the human level. Um, so, um, we're really small, just we, we have only have 20 some people, and uh, we are building quite a new um, AI models uh, that are somehow similar to deep learning, but also quite different. Great. So since, you know, we're spending all of our time on frameworks here, I think what would be helpful is if, you know, each of you could let us know how you're using, you know, these, these sort of learning frameworks within your company and how much of the main open source packages you're using and how much you're having to do some degree of customization for your, for your specific tasks or needs. Uh, so in our case, um, we use a few different things. I, I guess when we want to kind of use an existing model and just kind of throw it at some data to grab some features or do some quick transfer learning, we would often start with CAFE because it's just so easy, particularly the Python layer on top of CAFE. Uh, we generally use IPython Notebook as our kind of uh, system for interfacing with that. Um, for the actual stuff we, where we're kind of creating 3D convolutional networks uh, for, you know, MRIs, you know, generally speaking, we have to do a lot of new research uh, to make that work because the the kind of off the shelf packages just don't 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 cut it uh, so we generally have to uh, do quite a bit of research at the architectural level at the optimization level uh, at every level um, we generally uh, use a library that we've built in-house it sits on top of um, theano uh, theano is great because it's it's not just a deep learning package, it's a general purpose expression compiler which compiles um, expressions written in Python to run on the GPU. Uh, so then with the library we have on top of that, it can allow us to create generic directed acyclic graphs uh, and it'll you know, compile them and of course auto, auto differentiate them. Um, and that's what allows us, for example, when we implemented batch normalization, which is about 2,000 lines of CAFE code. It took uh, less than 50 lines of code in, in our library because it was designed for, you know, flexibility. Do you plan to, you know, contribute any of this back to open source at some point or do you need to make loads of money first and then back? I suspect we probably will. You know, as I said earlier on, I think deep learning is um, going to be commoditized. So I, I don't think we or anybody else necessarily should imagine that they can maintain competitive advantage just on the basis of their libraries or algorithms. Uh, clearly, uh, it's like if you were one of those companies that was doing um, image uh, image classification APIs as your business and then, you know, a month ago Google released their entire GoogleNet model to, as open source, it's like, okay, well now you're screwed. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I think we'd, we'll probably contribute most of our underlying architecture once we've had the chance to clean it up and document it and stuff. Great. And so, you know, how does this work at, at Facebook where you've obviously got a, a, a whole bunch of different frameworks being used by people? How do you make sure that they're being used effectively and you can actually translate that into production systems without building little bespoke kind of stacks? Right. Yeah. I mean, the sort of the ecosystem at Facebook is very interesting. So we have the sort of our research arm fair, you know, are like three or four of the most uh, sort of uh, prolific uh, torch, you know, sort of contributors. You, most of you, got, you know, you guys may know them. 
Um, at the same time, you know, cafe is a very interesting you know, environment. It's getting actually lots of interest for many people, especially in the compute, computer vision space. Uh, there are a few pockets of piano here and there. You know, there's interest in auto differentiation and, and the like. So um, there's a very, you know, you know, one of you know the core culture sort of principles at Facebook is that it tells you know anybody what to do. You know, you know, you, you download this open source toolkit and you go ahead and use it. But there's also a very important principle, uh, which is you know sort of re reproducibility, sharing, building on top of each other's contributions. Um, you know, is very very important. So interop between all of these tools is essential. It is one of the key sort of uh, you know strategies and key uh, uh, sort of mission statements that we actually own as the applied machine learning team. So it should be fairly easy for somebody who produced a you know cafe based model be able to port it to Torch and use it in a sort of the most seamless way as you know possible. Uh, it's easier said than done, so it's you know th th there's a sort of group of people who are dedicated to keep doing that, especially as these tools are are actually are being you know, sort of uh, improved and developed as as we speak. So um, interop is is really key. Um, at the same time, you know um, we as I said, Torch, you know. There is significant effort that we actually are putting into actually improving Torch, and we push these changes to open source regularly. Um, it's unlikely that we're going to do that for Cafe. I mean, it may happen someday. Uh, we synchronize regularly with the you know folks in, in Berkeley. You know, have you know, who are been working a lot on Cafe. We're aware of their Cafe two efforts, which actually looks a lot like Torch. <laughs> you know, in the way they're actually you know sort of you know how how you know, models are 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 defined as sort of code rather than data. Um, there are efforts in other companies also that are that are sort of heading in a so similar direction. Um, when it comes to training versus production, use of GPU <clears throat> for training and you know its viability for uh, this is something that we you know we worry about a lot. Um, you know GPUs are a very very important resource for deep learning, but they are you know they are expensive, and when it comes to their energy consumption, their, you know costs and stuff like that. So. Using them in production, we're very, you know, we're very, um, we, we have to use them in production, but we're using them in a very, uh, you know, sort of thoughtful and careful way. And again, it's one of, you know, things that we keep thinking about all the time and we produce tools to do that. How, how do you use them efficiently in the most efficient way possible? Just, just coming back to, so you, you, you know, you have a team working to make sure that you can integrate multiple frameworks sort of successfully into your production pipeline. Have you, have you built any tools to sort of help you do that, which you'll release or or are there any basic sort of bits of advice you'd offer to an organization that has multiple frameworks at play and needs to, needs to make sure that doesn't spiral into chaos? Right, yeah, we do. We do have a number of tools. Uh, when I talk about this interop, this involves sort of training, this involves, so for example, it's fairly straightforward, you know, you know Facebook to build a model in Torch and actually, you know, do the training in Torch and actually do the prediction in, you know, in, in Cafe, right? Uh, and we're doing it on deep basis, so there are new exotic models, I'm um, sorry, uh, 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 layers and nodes that are invented all the time. Um, and we, you know, if it's not present in CAFE, we end up building sort of the necessary changes or making the necessary changes to make it. Uh, at some point in time, some of this will actually make it to open source because we, we want to sort of... Yeah, we, create, we created a tool which converts things from CAFE into... Theano, uh, I suspect everybody probably has their own version of that tool. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, they're, they're similar enough that... You probably need to be able to switch amongst things uh, and to, yeah. to while things are still kind of maturing. Right. The fact that you know Torch and Cafe are using different sort of uh, scripting languages is very challenging, uh, and we ha we're, we're trying to find an answer to that too. Right. You know, Python is actually first class language inside inside of Facebook. Lua is not. So it's like one of the biggest barriers for people adopting Torch is oh I have to learn Lua. And stuff like that. So we're, you know, we're trying to do something that would help in this space, and hopefully we'll push it in open source at some point in time. Great. And uh, how do you, you know, how do you deal with this at, at Vicarious? And perhaps you could also give us a bit of an update on Vicarious, because mostly I think people know it as this company which, you know, successfully dealt with captures some years ago, and obviously that's now become a, a simpler task, which is also, I believe, solvable by other techniques. So tell us what you're, what you're doing now, and what you think sort of differentiates maybe. The, the capabilities your system has from other deep learning. Uh, sure. Um, so um, our story is a little bit different. Vicarious operates a little bit like a research lab. So we, um, we, uh, our main job is to 
build new models that can resemble the way human do the thinking, do the reasoning, and do the perception. So um, we try to build the models that are based on how the brain operates. Um, and, uh, and our model is very heavy, heavily relying on our understanding of neuroscience, our understanding of cognitive science. Um, so so um, because of this, our um, code base is, uh, is complete from scratch. We cannot build on any existing because it's a, a little bit different philosophy. Um, we have a mixture of, uh, um, of, um, of uh, Python and C, C obviously for the C and C plus for the speed consideration. Python is just easier to con reconfigurable. Um, so, so after the capture and story, we are extending to a bit of, uh, you know, our model is basically trying to, we try to extend to different applications like, uh, um, like a text recognition in the, in the wilder scenes, um, uh, which can be used, for example, in autonomous driving. You can, you can, you want to recognize student name, for example. Uh, it can be also, we are also trying to do um, robotic vision. Uh, we have a collaboration with ABB from Switzerland. So, um, so, so our we're a bit ambitious in this goal that we want to um, we want to build a system that is capable of um, of of um, of of asking questions and imagine what's what's the, what's in the in the room. For example, if 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 a system sees something new like a chair or table, he want to ask what what it is, or he may he may try to try to fetch some knowledge from from its previous understanding to see what's what's what the object is. So it's uh, going beyond the normal supervised way of uh, exactly telling what is this object or how it should like. So uh, this is uh, sometimes in um, um, called concept learning, uh, and uh, so so um, we are just uh, building towards that goal. And uh, current, at the current stage of Achilles is very much research, uh, and, and uh, we have some applications that we will build, um, but it's uh, down the way. Can you tell us a bit about? You know how you're doing the robotic, you know, collaboration specifically. Are you are you kind of co-designing a, a hardware platform on which you can deploy your system, and and how do you kind of have that level of conversation with someone like ABB when you're still very much in research mode, and it's not like you have a packaged thing you can just hand over to them. Um, I, I think it's yes. Yeah, so I think um, we we don't do the hardware side. It was completely provided by ABB, and it's actually very, they are very good at building those hardware, and they're also very good at uh, configuring the hardware. What they don't have is the ability to let the machine do the configuration by itself. So, uh, so what the, our collaboration is uh, is uh, still as it is as the and research stage. So we will get some um, robotic from them and get some of their of their support on. Build on, on controlling robot, robot, and then we can um, uh, just uh, inject our algorithm into the system and uh, try to, for example, see the object, and try to uh, ask what the object is. Yeah, so it's still at the um, kind of a, um, research collaboration. Okay, so you know, Jeremy and and, and Ahmed, as, you, as you're dealing with stuff where you're taking it from research directly into production, what are the most Common problems you, you you kind of encounter along the way, or or what, and were there any problems you encountered that were completely counterintuitive? So um, during the first year of our company, we spent as much time talking to hospital administrators, physicians, um, uh, academic and medical folks uh, as we did working on the technology. So to make sure that there wouldn't be any surprises. We found um, nearly everybody we spoke to in the healthcare world said the biggest problem with bringing kind of analytic technology into that world has always been um, workflow integration. In other words, people bring in technology which seemed like a good idea kind of back in San Francisco, but when they actually put it into the hospital setting, it just didn't fit with how the doctors actually treat, you know, see patients or deal with patients. So, for example, as recently as yesterday, I was talking to the CEO of a big radiology company who was saying they had just um, kind of invested in, in, in buying a whole bunch of uh, 3D medical visualization software and they were kind of horrified to discover once they started to try to use it that it, it required a whole separate computer and a whole separate software platform when in radiology 
you know, everybody forever has always just, like everything gets integrated in what's called what's called the PAX. The PAX is basically like the, the the software that the radiologist uses to find out what what to read next and to view the image and to you know um, uh, use voice recognition to put in their findings and to do their measurements and the idea of like oh now you have to like you know stop this copy it over here load this up it took you know as much time to do that as it would have to just read read the case so uh, by far the, it's not just medicine you know generally speaking going back even to my business strategy experience um, and perhaps this is why I've you know done quite a bit with kind of applied machine learning it's the application challenges not normally so much about the technology but around like how do you apply it in a way that makes you know real people in real jobs actually do it do it better yeah uh, there are, you know a whole set of really interesting pro problems that actually uh, sort of happen in the field or you know sort of uh, when one deals with product groups, as some some of which are you know totally unexpected and sort of funny at times. Um, uh, one of the problems you know th th that one faces, for example, you know helping a, a product group that hasn't used machine learning before incorporate a machine learning component, is what what I call the sort of the why question. You hear this question a lot from uh, from sort of you know, engineers who haven't practiced or maybe not literate in machine learning before is, you know, can you tell me why <laughs> the model decided to, uh, to misclassify this image as, you know, as not containing text, for example. And of course, we know as machine learning practitioners, we know this is, you know, it's very hard to answer, you know. It, it even is, is so acute at times that people resort to, to simpler, to linear models, for example, at the expense of accuracy, thinking that they are more explicable somehow or more observable as sort of control theory people, you know, observability, which is, you know, I think most of us know that this is not entirely true. So um, sort of why and how explicable the models are is something that annoys developers quite a bit. And the, the argument is that, you know, if I don't know why uh, certain misclassifications happen or sort of accuracy or accuracy deficiencies or errors happen, um, you know, I cannot proceed further, I cannot improve, I cannot improve my future engineering, which is not entirely true. Uh, but it's sort of a, it's it's intuitively human, you know. It's natural for human to to, to feel so. So, doing a you know uh, what we call sort of providing tools for model debugging, uh, or for understanding you know if there are any data efficiency inefficiencies of any data bugs, um, uh, problems in sort of in the sensory sort of information being collected, you know, it's something that we do a lot uh, to help people understand why things go wrong when they do. We, we found that answering the why question, um, you could, we found like for obviously for doctors, if you say, you know, this is our recommendation, you have to explain why, because in the end it's the doctor's decision as to whether or not to sign off on that report. And if they make a mistake, then they're the ones who are going to get sued um, and that'll be the end of their career. Um, and so at first when we heard why, we thought the answer was kind of like, well, this is how the algorithm works. But actually, the why that works is to, that's what I was explaining earlier, we show them, you know, in deep learning space, here are other previous patients that are similar to this one. Um, and then their brain can do the why. Like, like I, I'm not a doctor, I have no idea why that, like what they get out of that. But, you know, they look at it and they say, oh, I, I, can, I see as a human expert the, the consistent features. And so... We found that kind of using exemplars in deep learning is a great way to to answer the why question. Have you um just just quickly have you had to instrument your models at sort of vicarious to to do this or or are you is it more like they they explode in your face and then you go in and rewrite them because you're researchers? Yeah, I think uh, we we haven't encountered those problem yet. Um, and uh, um, so most of people we interact, um, they are mostly technical people. So so we can basically um, explain our ideas. And but but uh, in general, and uh, um, in general, we, we we try to. It's just basic communication. We try to develop a language that can be understood by everybody. We try to make it simple. And another story about us, which is which is good, is that we try to, as as we our philosophy is to build like as a human like a human baby would learn stuff. 
So when we want to explain our technology doing something, it's, it's working on something, we can just explain as the baby is doing something. Yeah. Baby is learning this way, so we are also learning this way. But, but is this actually like a, a true analogy? Because I think, you know, and the media, probably including me, are guilty of this, but we say like all deep learning technology or AI technology is like the brain and you know, it isn't, as Jeremy said, it's, a, it's an Excel spreadsheet, and, you know, you can write some macros. Is, is your stuff somehow more like it, and, and, and how would it, would um, it be we, more like it? Yeah, we, we think our, um, yeah, we, we think our, our technology is a, do um, resemble more of the human brain um, um, system, and, uh, um, and uh, um, um, you know, we have very well controlled layers. For example, you know, of course, we have hierarchy. We have very well, very well controlled layers. Every layer performs something that is just like the layer in the human human cortex. So that certain correspondence, and we try to really build and try to solve it. Of course, it cannot be a hundred percent matching. It shouldn't be a hundred percent match because it's different to different systems. Um, um, and and beyond that, and in our learning procedure, we also try to resemble how a, how, a, how a little human would learn stuff. And, uh, and, uh, and I don't believe that uh, um, we were unique from this perspective. I mean, I, I, I kind of wonder why, what the interest in the question is though, Jack. I mean, is, like, is it better to be more brain-like or worse? I mean, I think the thing, the thing I like about machine learning is that we have this totally transparent platform now called Kaggle where you can go and find out who's the best at X for all X, you know? Um, so it is interesting that like with, with deep learning, like the neuroscientist on our, t on our team certainly very regularly points out the correspondences between deep learning and the way the brain works. It's certainly biologically inspired. Um, but you know, we've kind of, I like to think as a, as a community that we might've moved beyond the kind of ours is better than yours because it's more brain like kind of version to like ours is better than yours because it, you know, in this transparent, open, independent machine learning competition beat everybody else's approach. And I think deep learning has really proven itself there, you know, like, like Keras, for example. Keras has won a number of Kaggle competitions, so it's like you can't argue that it's like, okay, that's, that's, that really works, you know. Yeah, I mean, to, just to be frank, I think my question was motivated more by sort of organic narcissism and, and, and a love of being a sort of biological creature. Um, it, it serves no purpose. Like this stuff will have performance, and the underlying stuff doesn't matter. It, My brain is a spreadsheet, out. by the way. So that's, that's what McKinsey does, I guess. Yeah, I'm controlled by VPA. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it. You know, well, it plays a lot to the hype that the you know sort of the media sort of propagates, and sort of you know, there's some PR value to that. But I, I, I agree. I, I don't think it should. Be, it, it's not a goal in itself to try to sort of mimic the brain. And we all know that the models that we're using are naively, you know, not even close to how the brain, you know, which is, we know very little about to start with. But it's okay to, you know, there is a good reason to try to be, you know, sort of, this, this is a, you know, this is an organ that we hardly understand and it works very well on certain tasks. So it's not completely, you know, uh, you know, meaningless to try to sort of, try to get ideas. And I, and I think there's kind of this whole, uh, there was a pushback, you know, of like, oh, it's, nothing to do with the brain, which I heard for a while, which is yeah. definitely not true. Like I had, a, I had a very funny thing at a dinner the other day, it was sort of a deep learning dinner, and a, there was a professor there who said, it's ridiculous to say it's anything like the brain. I mean, like the brain doesn't have anything like back propagation, you know, it's just crazy. And then, um, uh, as I, I hope he doesn't mind me mentioning his name, it's Naveen actually from Nirvana said, kind of put up his hand and said, well, actually it, it is. And the professor was like, well, how would you know? And Naveen's answer was, I'm a neuroscientist. And well, what was your PhD in? How the brain works like back prop. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, J Jeff Hinton has a, a video on YouTube where he says much the same thing. He explains to a bunch of skeptical people, I'm going to prove to you why I, I think that back propagation is happening in, in the brain. Um, you know, something we touched on earlier in the previous presentation was memory networks. You know, that's obviously one of, I guess, the newer areas or the frontier areas. It obviously builds on previous work and stuff like long short-term memory and, you know, recurrent nets, which we've had for a while. From, from your perspectives, what are some of the areas where you're seeing new, new techniques come in which could, could give you sort of new capabilities? And, and how mature are some of the newer things like, you know, memory or inference or ability to deal with, you know, streaming data live? 
I mean, I, I thought that um, Keras presentation on the Facebook memory network, whilst perhaps a little on the snarky side, it was quite interesting to point out that, you know, it is actually it's it's not a new thing. And to me, this is the most cool thing is that we now have some recognition that you can plug together modules, you know, whether it like Torch and Keras actually look pretty similar, uh, you know, you have this sequential layer and then you have this merge and blah, blah, blah. Um, and I feel like there's this, there's almost this new, well, it's not new, but this kind of emerging field of kind of crafting architectures, you know, like a Siamese architecture or, you know, uh, combining, you know, stacking LSTMs and blah, 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 where people are, it's not that there are a whole new, you know, I feel like we've got sequence to sequence learning, you know, with LSTM, we've got um, fixed length vector learning with, sta you know, with standard um, uh, deep learning. And we've got, of course, any kind of uh, structural space learning with convolutional nets. So we kind of have the basic pieces. And what I think is really cool is the way we now have these ways to combine them in, in kind of arbitrary, interesting ways, uh, you know, um, and to create like a, a memory network or a question and answer network or whatever. That, that's the biggest excitement for me of the last kind of six months or a year. And we've had, you know, combining texts and images. Obviously, that's work by Google and Bard. Yeah, you know, and, and, when you, and again, you look, at, you look at the Keras implementation of that and it's another 15 lines of code because, they're, you know, there's this recognition that they're all just differentiable graphs. Or another really great example is um, spatial transformer networks. How many of you guys have come across spatial transformer networks? A really simple idea, which is, hey, you used to basically have to find the cat in an image by like saying, is it here, 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 right? Scanning across the whole thing that took forever. And then somebody made the really fairly obvious point that like an affine transform, in other words, saying, you know, the corners of, of the image are here, 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 and here. Moving those corners, if you do it um, rather than pixel by pixel, but you actually kind of interpolate across pixels, that's differentiable. And as long as it's differentiable, you can chuck it into your backprop. And so you chuck in a, you can chuck this into your backprop and you end up with a layer that automatically finds the thing in the image. Um, so I, I kind of feel like deep learning is moving from kind of multi-layer perceptrons to general differentiable expression graphs, you know, and that, I think that's Pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so there are, you know, like two or three really sort of uh, very, very exciting areas that I see sort of uh, at least us at Facebook and some other parts of the machine learning community moving to. One is actually, uh, you know, sort of unsupervised learning or semi-supervised learning. We have way more unsupervised and sort of semi-supervised data that we haven't really efficiently put to use yet. And representation learning in general has the potential of actually putting this to use in, a, in ways that actually hasn't you know, hasn't happened before. Uh, actually, speaking of memory networks, I, I wanted to thank Francois for the very nice compliments he said about Facebook and <laughs> his talk, thanks very much. Um, uh, but in many ways, actually, this movement actually is not new, right? Uh, folks like Jan Lecun and Jeff Hinton has been talking, preaching about this, and I, I'm of the generation. I, uh, I graduated in the sort of early 90s, and it was all neural nets and all conferences, and then there was sort of, as Jeff Hinton said, the last decade, you know, where people were fascinated by SVMs and sort of graphical models and such. And, you know, and then there's renewed interest in nets. And honestly, fundamentally, there's nothing new. We have much more data. We have, you know, stronger CPU. And, but essentially, really, the techniques, they have the roots in the stuff that happened in the early 90s. So in many ways, you can say there's nothing new, but there is. So I think supervised, you know, better use of unsupervised data. Reinforce, reinforcement learning and Q-learning is very, very interesting. The folks that DeepMind, uh, the, the stuff that DeepMind is doing is very, very interesting. Um, and um, also uh, vision applications that go beyond mimicking human capabilities. So, okay, ImageNet is great. We can recognize amongst, you know, 1,000 classes or more. And, but this is already something humans are good at. Can we build stuff that would do, go beyond human capabilities? Can I look at a picture of a meal and tell you what the color content is, you know, can I tell you exactly what kind of dog breed that is, sort of really augmenting sort of human capabilities and being you know, sort of useful. So, you know, applications like that, now we're in the cusp of solving uh, stuff like that. And these are areas we're really sort of interested in and the architectures that can actually do that. 
Um, does does Vicarious have plans to? Are you going to like publish a paper or start giving more detailed presentations? Because you've been very quiet for several years now. Uh, yes, I think I think we um, I think we are, we are preparing a like a major sort of a report, technical report on a lot of stuff we have done, um, um, and uh, um, and uh, um, so. Um, Back to what you said about the future um, stuff, I think um, one thing important is, is, uh, is what you just said about the unsupervised learning. Uh, I do agree this is a particularly important uh, um, thing people have to do, people will pursue after. And the uh, one reason is that the thing is like, I mean, most popular technique like CN is just very, very much um, data heavy. You need a lot of data to do that. And, it, it, and uh, and uh, in practice, as we believe, it doesn't make sense to train you on uh, like a million images and predict a hundred. You are supposed to train on hundred, predict a million. That's actually how human will do it. Uh, so you need to go beyond that step uh, as purely supervised and going through some unsupervised. Um, this is one thing. The second thing is that uh, um, people are gener generally trying to make the model more generative than, than as it was pre more for discriminative. So you are you are capable of building images from scratch using like a scene or other type of technique. So uh, make it generative, meaning you model actually understand more of the image data itself rather than just the corresponding between data and the label. And the third thing, um, third thing is the reinforcement learning, mainly boosted by deep minds and Q learning stuff. Um, but on this point, I I, I think I agree with the. Uh, for example, Yan Lacun from uh, Facebook, it's not, it's not going to be a big deal. It's, uh, because the, the, the information you receive from the reinforcement the loop is actually very limited. Sup unsupervised learning is a much bigger issue and more important issue than reinforcement learning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Reduction. Intentionality reduction already a problem in both. My but uh, a one housekeeping forty in the next a the value decline for represent. data can be like low dimensional representation. Um, that's, a, that's a really um, fair point. I think um, it's a, probably just a matter of terminology. And uh, I think uh, um, what you mentioned about those uh, technical PCA, whatever stuff, those are, those are just one aspect of the unsupervised learning. It's just the you know, dimensionality of that. It's just the one way of coming up with a certain representation that it is in lower dimension. But what we, we mainly about unsupervised learning is, is a very general sense, just saying that I don't need to provide so heavy supervision. I don't want to give you so many labels and annotation exact positions. So try to come up with a model that makes sense, that makes sense uh, with what you have observed in the real world. So it's, it's more of a gen general concept, I would say. But I mean, all I think all deep learning pretty much is maybe maybe reinforcement learning doesn't fit this bill, but all deep learning is basically just dimensionality reduction. It starts with a you know, 50 by 50 pixel image and gets it down to a one dimensional thing, which is that's the number one, that's the number two, that's the number three, or that's with a 250 by 250 color image and gets it down to a dimension that's, that's a cat, that's a dog. Um, I mean, so uh, the, the, that's kind of all deep learning does in a sense is, but I mean, that, that's in a sense is what knowledge representation is. Obviously, PCA is just going to give you much less nuanced dimensionality reduction or SVD because they rely on linear decompositions. Um, you can have a decomposition that's, you know, 24 layers of, um, you know, nonlinearities, then we know that we can just create much better representations, basically. Right. Well, you know, to be specific, you know, unsupervised data can, for example, you know, I think the best example for using them, compute embeddings, for example, like word to vec 
has been used, you know, published by Google, it has been used by, you know, the impact actually it has in a number of publications that has been based on where to vac, you know, is awesome. And it was built using like 300 million sort of unsupervised, you know, sort of words. But just, as I said earlier, text. it's kind of supervised because they invented a supervised problem, which was, you know, predict, you know, is this the one where it's got the random word in the middle or the one where it doesn't? Right. So like so unsupervised learning, you always convert to a supervised problem right. first. That's called semi-supervised about that. Uh, another one actually, so semi-supervised data or unsupervised data can be used a lot for regularization. And uh, like the very early versions of deep belief nets. Uh, the non-convolution ones would not have converged without the use of autoencoders. This was a way to actually initialize weights. Now with convolution nets, and you know, we don't need to do that anymore. But you know, the very early versions relied on autoencoders and such. Uh, you know, you, which just needed only super unsupervised data to to actually converge. So I think we'll be inventing new types of networks that are you know big, you have have huge capacities, you know, very high VC dimension that would need to be regularized using unsupervised data. I think they will play, play a you know, critical role in the space. Um, and uh, learning representations that are um, sort of maybe, uh, you know, sort of close in Euclidean space for words, for people, for, uh, for, for objects that we can reason about sort of in supervised uh, you know, uh, learned systems. Uh, but computing such embeddings doesn't necessarily need you know, supervised data. I think this is this is another role that unsupervised data can play. We're sort of running up towards the, the magical word lunch. So I've got a, a sort of last question, and then if anyone has any burning ones, to stick your hand up. Which is, you know, how do you deal with scenarios where you have access to, to very little data? Like with some of your medical stuff, are you encountering cases where you actually don't have enough to do the sort of traditional things? And and what do you do to deal with with that type of problem? Yeah. <clears throat> Absolutely. I mean, take pediatrics, for example, you know, kids have weird diseases and they, and they look weird as well. You know, they come up in weird looking ways, whether it be in the MRI or the 12 lead ECG or whatever. So pediatrics is a great example of like lots and lots of afflictions there. It's hard to get much data for. A very specific example in pediatrics is, you know, sadly, um, sometimes kids die just suddenly when they're playing a sporting event, you know, sudden death syndrome. And um, it is actually possible to look at a 12-lead ECG, so, you know, looking at the, you know, um, signals from the heart, and see the, see in those signals, you can figure out that this kid is at risk of that. Um, so what would we need to build a deep learning model that can take, you know, you could walk into any clinic, get a 12-lead ECG done, which is easy and cheap, but then have something say, okay, you're at risk of sudden death. We need a data set that has 12 lead ECG signals and did this guy end up dying in the next year of sudden death, which means we need to find all the kids, you know, who did die of this and find the small subset that had 12 lead ECGs done in the previous year and collect, collect them all together. So that's hard, right? And so, for example, um, in pediatrics, there's a... a consortium of 42 hospitals that we're helping get involved with where they're combining their data together to make get as much of this as possible. It, even then, to use this effectively, we're not going to be able to initialize a deep learning network from scratch. So we're going to have to, we, you're going to have to, and we do use um, a lot of transfer learning. So the, what we're trying to do is to basically build a, a kind of, in some sense, a single human, a single deep learning network of the whole human body uh, whether it be sick or well, under all kinds of modalities, you know, MRI or ultrasound or whatever, because um, effectively we want to be in a position where we say, okay, here's a new data set that's come in. Uh, we already know how to create great semantic features for, you know, ECGs, for example. So effectively it's, you know, just a great semantic dimensionality reduction. And then we only need like, you know, 50 examples of, of 50 positive examples to diagnose and treat that affliction in the, in the future. And that, like, that, actually, that actually works. You know, we've definitely seen examples where it was just like 50 positive cases of an ailment. As long as we can use transfer learning, you know, we, can, we can build an effective model. Does, a, does Facebook have any sources of data which it doesn't have enough of? Or? Yes, yes. <laughs> actually, yeah, you're reading my mind. I was going to say it may, you guys may think that we 
there are a few problems where we don't have data for, but no, they, they do exist. Uh, there are certain setups where there is tons of unsupervised data, and the question is, how do, how do you label these efficiently? So really smart ways of doing active learning of sorts, you know, grab, you have bandwidth to hand, hand judge, but you really need to use it efficiently. So using it efficiently is very critical. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, doing, you know, active, le active learning is, you know, we, we use it a lot in our space. Um, but actually data augmentation is also very, you know, you can augment the data that you have from sort of a public sources. And yeah, the signal to noise ratio on the, on the label is not going to be high, but it's good enough, you know, that you, you're, you're basically trying to, um, yes, I don't have, I don't, there's neither quality or quantity. I'll get quantity, but, you know, quality is going to be really, um, you know, questionable. But I, I can do, it's better than, better than nothing. That helps a lot. Also, there are very cool bootstrapping methods, actually. Um, there are way, you know, these go back in the, you know, sort of old handwriting recognition days where people were able to sort of, uh, using bootstrapping methods to sort of automatically label unlabeled data. Work by Isabel Guyon and uh, some folks in at and Labs. And again, you know, the signal to noise ratio on the data is not very high, but it ends up being much more useful. Um, there's synthetic data that people, you know, there's some domains and problems that people can generate synthetic data. It seems the verdict on this that it's not very useful. Uh, people use sort of tend to use affine transformations to generate this data. And usually these are very easy to learn by the model. So synthetic data, yes, but in, in very unconventional ways to change the, you know, to, to, to synthesize data. And this goes along, you know, building generative models to generate data for training can be very, very useful. But it has to be unconventional, like simple generative models don't usually work very well. Yeah, just to finish off, does Vicarious, you know, can you give us a tangible example of the way that your sort of approach works with situations where you don't have much data or you're not giving it much? Yeah, is it, uh, this is a really good question for us because we are, our system actually, our model actually build work on very limited data. As I mentioned, we are, um, uh, as maybe it's a human recognition, uh, human perception is a you, 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 you were trained on seeing a hundred cars, you can recognize a million cars. It's not should be the way, say, as we are around. So we are exactly doing like this. I'll give one example is that um, we test our model on a public text recognition data set. It is like a, you recognize text in the wild or any kind of scenes. And uh, the previous best result uh, used five million training images. And uh, we can beat them. And our training is only 2,000 images. So we, we have orders of magnitude lower amount of data we can just uh, do it better. Because we inject a lot of knowledge into the, into the model itself. And uh, our, you know, the, the, the key core technology in our system is, is actually the graphical model. That's our core technology. Great. Well, thank you to all of the panelists. And it's lunch now. Um, just to finish off, I have one small trivia point. So who here has seen deep dream images, you know, with uh, sort of crazy hallucinatory things? So that has a predilection for like eyeballs and dogs. That's the stuff which appears in these images or bubbles up when they're using the kind of pre-trained stuff. I heard recently that, you know, the, the ImageNet sort of two data set is being put together right now by Fei Fei Li and others at Stanford. And systems which sort of have a pre-trained version based on that will have a predilection for toilets and giraffes. So that's something to look forward to in the next 